the Echo Chamber, brought to you by The Homes Report and produced by the international broadcast specialist, Marketeers. Sponsored by The Bullet Group, putting you in tomorrow's conversations today. Hello everyone and welcome to the Echo Chamber. This is Maya Pavinska-Sims, the Homes Report's Europe, Middle East and Africa editor. And I'm in a rather unseasonably warm London for October with John Tipple, who's the Chief Strategy Officer Worldwide at Future Brand, which this week launched its fourth annual Future Brand Index on how future-proof the world's top companies are. John, welcome to the Echo Chamber. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about you because you're not just a representative future brand, you're a person in your own right with a huge amount of expertise. Um, John's got a a, a, a really rich background in direct marketing, advertising, innovation and brand experience. Um, You joined uh, Ogilvy and May, the graduate scheme, and you've worked at agencies including Saatchi's, FCB and McCann, Mm -hmm. joined Future Brand in 2012, and you've worked with some pretty oppressive brands, London Olympics, Red Bull, Microsoft, Nestle, Virgin Bacardi and the BBC, and you've won a million industry awards together. So <laughs> oh if anyone God. knows what they're talking about, it should be John. Oh dear, the pressure. Um, so John, kick, uh, kick us off. Tell us a bit about Future Brand and your current role there. Well, I, sure. Thank you. And I say thank you for having me on. Um, Future Brand is, I think it's about 20 years old, just over. Um, uh, it uh, originally had its roots as a sort of uh, a combination of design and consultancy and, and product design. And it's evolved over time through becoming a, through a brand, you know, into a classic brand consultancy. And now we've come out a little bit out the other side and evolved into what we've, we now describe and now we're known as the Creative Future Company. Mm. And the core of our business is actually future proofing businesses through, their, through brands, you know, e- either through the corporate brand or through uh, um, uh, consumer or service brands. And um, we're present across the world. Um, I I would describe our people as a sort of community of of quite entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, interesting, creative brand experts. And, you know, we we sort of aspire to help businesses uh, define themselves, you know, what is classically called through their purpose, but Mm -hmm. also take that on a lot further in terms of bring the purpose to life because... It's, it's, it's a lot of uh, a lot of businesses and a lot of brands out there have a purpose these days. The, the big difference is to what extent you're able to witness that through the actions you take every day for anyone who's involved in the brand or who works with the brand or, his, or who buys from or whatever from the brand. Mm. So that's that's a potted history of future brands. Uh, my role within it um, is, uh, I suppose, that the title chief strategy officer, you know, means to some extent being responsible for the thinking, the IP um, of the company of which the Future Brand Index is a key part of that. We do other things as well. Um, you know, we're quite well known for country branding, which is a, another conversation perhaps mm-hmm. for another time. Um, and it's also obviously being responsible for for our clients and working on client business because, you know, like in every business these days, everyone has to sing for their supper yeah. these days, you know, as well as, as, well as just be uh, as well as just be focused on what we are as a company. So tell me about this key bit of IP, the Future Brand Index, which sure, we're talking about sure, today. Sure, sure. Why... How did it come about and why is it so important? Well, I mean, it, it, in, to some extent, if you call yourself future brand, um, it's always quite useful to have something that gives you some sort of point of view on the future. Yeah, and that would be good. It's helpful, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> the, the, the trouble with the future as well, I mean, is the future is so bloody hard to predict. Um, it would be easier if it wasn't. But uh, actually, no, I mean, we're, we're not a futurology company. Um, what we tend to do is we tend to um, work with companies um, and, and talk and, and, and gear the conversation around uh, just beyond the horizon of what they can see for themselves. And in order to give us some uh, confidence and some credibility in that space, about uh, four or five years ago, uh, we devised the Future Brand Index. What it does, um, and I think it's quite unique, it's, it, it's the only actual rigorous assessment of um, the future potential, the future success, likelihood of success for companies. And it's based not necessarily on our point of view. We don't make any assessment, uh, any um, assumptions within it. What we do is we start with the PwC Global Top 100 Companies, which is a annual ranking that they do based on market capitalization. And we have an association with them. Were you going to come in on that one? Well, it's just literally, so it's the the 100 biggest. Yeah, I mean, I think they take it, I think there's a a day, usually just before Easter, around the end of the financial Mm. year, where PwC will, will, will take a cut and they will look at who are, and they call it the Global Top 100, which are the the top 100 companies in the world by market capitalization, which is quite an interesting um, thing when you stop and think about it, because in some ways it's actually a perception score itself. You know, as as everyone listening will probably know, a market cap is 
you know, it's, it's simply a calculation, a, a dollar value, if you like, based on the number of outstanding shares a company has and the share price. And share price is in itself a kind of sentiment number. So there's a degree of perception built in right there. Um, and, you know, like a lot of rankings and brand rankings that exist, rankings that attempt to put a valuation on things, they're a snapshot of what's happening right now. Or in many ways, they're sort of a reflection of what's happened up until, up until a given date. Because mm. um, most data, in fact, all data in the world comes from one place. It comes from the past. Yeah. So if you're called future brand, you have to somehow make sense of that, you know, take that, that, that on. And, and we take the uh, PwC number, which, as I said, is a market cap based um, valuation. Uh, which is part perception. And then we build our own perception study looking into the future, which is taking some uh, brand attributes, 18 of them, um, 18 brand attributes. And we ask and, and use the responses of a global public to reorg reorder the PwC Top 100 list to identify which companies are the most future-proofed on that list. So you get a sense of where they are today and through the index, a sense of where they could be tomorrow. So tell me a bit more about that uh, notion of being future proof. Um, how does the brand's ranking, whether it's rising or falling, yeah. all the different attributes, your yeah, yeah, huge yeah. list, how, how does that correlate with being future proof? Um, the, the way that um, our survey works and the way our study works is that we ask a, an informed global public, not just you know, a, a particularly selected group of people who have an opinion or are in some way, in, some way informed about brands, um, and we ask them to um, evaluate um, the brands on the PwC Top 100, but only brands that they are aware of and know something about. So at all times, we're trying to build in a level of informedness into right. our findings. And, what's, and we ask them about a range of attributes, as I mentioned, linked to, to attributes that you typically associate with future health, such as the ability to be, um, have a positive vision of the future, mm -hmm. the ability to be changing lives for the better, the ability to bringing a sense of inspiration, well-being, uh, quality of your people, um, the ability to manage resources well, uh, for example. Um, there are fully 18, and we did talk about whether I can remember all 18 of them, <laughs> yeah. and I can promise you I can't. In alphabetical order. Exactly. That was the challenge. Exactly, yeah. Um, but we take those 18, and, and what we've done working with QRI, who's our research partner on this, and then we've organized those into um, purpose uh, attributes and experience attributes. And what we find is that the brands that are most future-proofed the brands that are most likely to grow in the future, and that we've seen this continually through the four years of the survey, are the ones that are doing the very best job of aligning not just why they exist, their purpose, but also aligning that purpose with the experiences they create for people every day. Because, you know, one of the things, and I know purpose is a critical big issue within the world of PR, but within the world of communications, and within the world of brands and marketing mm -hmm. full stop. But what we're seeing much more of is, is having a purpose is one thing making sure your purpose is, is fully brought to life through the experiences that you're able to deliver to people every day. And when I say people, I do mean employees, I mean end user customers, I mean um, you know, customers within a B2B environment, right mm -hmm. through to stakeholders, investors, anyone who's involved in and around the brand, to actually bring to life the purpose, because it's easy to come up with something you aspire for your company, it's yeah. how do you actually deliver it. Um, I used to work with a creative director who said, you know, who's, who ran his own company, but he said a, a principle is not a principle until it's cost you some money. Yeah. And the idea that you're actually investing in experiences um, that uh, that deliver on your purpose, and the, and the companies that are the, doing this the best are the companies that are most future proofed. So, purpose. Let's just stay with purpose yeah, while sure. we're here. I mean, it's unquestionably the buzzword of the moment, as you said, in in the business we're in. And it's, um, it's that correlation with brand experience that defines the most successful and future-proof companies mm -hmm. as far as you define them. Tell me what you guys consider to be a purpose brand because it feels a bit like we're, we're, we're assuming that everybody understands what a brand with purpose actually mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. um, which happens a lot. And, and how that... Um, how that defines the most and least successful this companies this year? Yeah, sure. I mean, in in, in some ways, I, I mean, I, I think that the notion of a purpose brand is is almost we're almost getting past that now. Um, you know, where purpose purpose came from was this idea that brands need to have some sort of utility, mm. that brands exist not just to make money, that brands, you know, that there, there were some you know seminal you know, seminal bo books. I mean, Jim Stengel wrote um, a very famous both book called Grow, which was all about balancing yes. what you stand for. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, profit can also come with purpose, you know, and I think the idea of generosity, the idea of a sort of more um, responsible capitalism, mm. I think, was at the core of this. So out of sort of, I mean, I, if you go back and look at this over a, a longer view, you see, you know, post 80s, 90s, you see the post, um, you know, um, greed is good. Yeah. 
yeah. into a more benevolent world, into a world of slightly more generous, mm. where in order to grow, companies needed to demonstrate that they weren't just profiteering, money-making machines, that they actually had some social good associated mm. with them. I think as we've moved on from that a little bit now, what we're seeing is it's all very well having a purpose because it's very easy to come up with you know a statement about your purpose. And most purposes in the world are... I think there was almost a purpose um, fanaticism where, you know, individual brands suddenly were here to save humanity from everything in the world. I think that's still happening. Is that not happening? I think that, I think that, um, I think that people, are, I think brands that do go down that, that line um, are being slightly called out because one of the other thing that's grown in, in conjunction with purpose is the way consumers in particular, empowered by social media mm -hmm. and the internet and, and other, and other um, t uh, tools are able to interrogate and, and, and able to interrogate what brands do and the need for some degree of transparency. Mm. I think also that the idea of offsetting, the idea of I'm going to do some terribly bad things over here to the planet, but then plant some trees over there will right. somehow make it okay is, is kind of, I think that's got been slightly cooled out. Um, but I do think that the idea of having a, a, an aspiration to make people's lives better, not just to change them, but to change them for the better is one of the key differentiators right now that we're seeing. So there's, there's, People are slightly leery about tech companies right now. Mm. Certainly our, 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 our findings suggest that there's a degree of, I, I guess, a question mark around some, for example, tech companies who are certainly changing our lives, but are they genuinely changing our lives for the better? Yeah. Um, and I think that's where some of the healthcare brands are, 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 are coming more to the fore because not only are they saying they're changing our lives for the better, they're actually producing um, D devices or drugs or um, you know uh, treatments that are actually not just helping people for example live longer but also live better mm. when they live longer as well so you can manifestly feel the purpose coming to life let's talk a little bit more later about tech mm. and healthcare because sure, sure, they're sure. two really interesting mm. sectors in the report this year um let's go back to the beginning who's done really well this year who's really shot up through the ranks who's at the top who's at the top mm. this well this year i can reveal uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. it's actually walt disney world which is a really interesting uh, brand. So obviously, well, you know, one of the big things we're seeing on the survey is that we're 10 years on from the financial crash, I think has been, been well documented. The expectation as we've come through this is that new digital companies, digital service-based businesses would be the ones that would benefit. So, you know, car companies that, you know, the biggest, Uber, for example, didn't, wouldn't need to own any cars. Mm. Uh, Airbnb was a great example of, of, of a, you know, travel company that didn't provide real travel and did, certainly didn't own hotels. Yeah. And I think while those, some of those companies are still incredibly successful and will no doubt be part of the future, what we're seeing actually is an interesting um, resilience among pre-millennium older mm. companies. And Walt Disney World is a classic example of that. In fact, I think there's something really interesting about Walt Disney World and Netflix. So mm. Walt Disney World is, 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 at, is at one. And uh, Netflix is, I think, the highest entrant this year at, at 15. Okay. And they're both broadly in the same space. They're both, you know, content, you know, content providers. They make their own content. They provide their own platforms. What's really interesting is when you look further down the line, people are more excited and believe that Netflix will probably overtake Walt Disney World in the future. Mm. But that's three years, four years hence. Right now, Walt Disney World is right up there. When I, when I look, you know, across who are the real, you know, to go back to your question of mm. who are the real exciting, you know, the exciting most future-proof brands or what we call the brands with the highest future-proof factor, there are some of the sort of, fav you know, the companies you'd expect to see. Mm. Um, yes, we have um, tech brands like Apple and uh, Samsung and Intel and Microsoft. There are healthcare companies that have come in. I mentioned those, um, you know, AbbVie, Gilead, Ch Johnson & Johnson. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's also some really interesting, I mean, Inditex, the owners of, of Zara and uh, Massimo Dutti, mm is in our top 10 and they've been really strong for a long time. And, the, and, it, and there's something really interesting about the way that they are defying all the odds about the death of retail, the death Absolutely. of the high street. Yeah. Um, and that's in sharp contrast to some of the more traditional retailers that haven't managed to, to, to maintain their momentum. So there's certainly some really interesting companies in the top 10. There are some really interesting movers and shakers that are not necessarily moving and shaking companies. So uh, AB InBev, uh, Nestle, have done a really, a, a really being uh, um, perceived to be embracing a new sort of startup mentality. Yeah. They're embracing technology. They're embracing data. GSK is another one, you know, very traditional, historic brand with a long history, but are actually learning new ways to compete and new ways to operate. And I think they're attracting, you know, people want to go and work for those companies. Perhaps people who've gone through the startup process now are looking for something to establish that culture within 
um, big organisations like like the ones I've just mentioned. And Nestle is an interesting case in point. I'm yeah. surprised to see they've leapt up this year. They've had their years, years and years of reputational challenges. Yeah. What 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 are they doing right now? Um, the, the one thing I the one thing I'll say on on uh, you know the one thing to flag about the survey is we don't necessarily have a direct causal links between the findings we see. We can't go because of that then this. Okay. What we can see is what indicators are companies like Nestle improving on, and then you can infer mm. what might be shaping people's perceptions. Because our, our report doesn't go into, you know, <laughs> I, I'm sure there'll be some disclaimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But also, yes, of course, I mean, there'll be some research people out there that will, you know, the moment I walk out here, I'll be shot. So it's correlation rather than causation. Yeah, I would yeah. say. I mean, I think it's probably intuitive mm. as well. But I think um, if you look at Nestle, they are investing in um, uh, system brands, by which I mean they're not just selling products anymore, they're building in services. Mm. I mean, this is the company that, of course, brought us Nespresso, yep. um, famously revolutionized the way people thought about coffee at home, barista quality coffee at home, and that is a whole, clo- oh, until recently, a closed system yeah. that you bought into, and it was a whole service experience. And I think that experience has, has been an inspiration to many companies, mm. but also an inspiration to other divisions within Nestle. I think they've also got some very innovative um, uh, premium uh, proposition uh, areas within their business. They're very strong in things like pet care. But I think fundamentally they've done things like um, really embrace innovation. Mm. Um, and I think that the ability to, through, through various um, platforms, to connect with startup organizations and understand how those organizations work. And the attraction, of course, for those startup organizations is the scale and experience and the whole sort of structures that brands like Nestle bring. So I think they've been really advanced on things like that, advanced potentially in more ways than, than some of the other companies who do expect to be um, doing well in that regard, but perhaps are, at the moment are a little bit held back. So mm. Unilever is a good comparison point to Nestle. Obviously, that you know Unilever in many ways, the, the, the sort of the original purpose company, mm. um, you know, strong, long history of, you know, best marks, some of the best marketers in the world. At the moment are going, I, I, I don't know what it is quite, but there seems to be a little bit of a confidence crisis around what that brand stands for and why it exists and how that is manifest in the day-to-day experiences. And uh, with Unilever, wasn't there kind of the greatest emotion anyone expressed about it was indifference, indifference which is yeah. like, like breaks my heart yes, in a way, even absolutely. though I don't work for Unilever. Yeah. It's the last thing you want to hear is about yeah, it. Yeah, no, yeah. Nobody cares. Yeah, yeah. Um, who's, who's, I mean, Unilever one is, is one of the brands that's kind of, sinking a little bit this year on the index who else is going down and what what are they getting wrong do you think what would you um, infer from your the answer research? always comes back i mean uh, I, you know again I, at risk of being um um turfed out of the uh, brand marketing magic circle <laughs> um there isn't too much rocket science here i mean there is a there is a, there is a fundamental principle that if you stand for something that is relevant and appealing to people i.e something that is benign and benevolent that is m- somehow moving the planet or humanity or mm. both forward and you deliver experiences every day that deliver on that, then that is the kind of secret sauce. That mm. is the answer. That's the only game in town right now for marketing. It's not easy to do that. And you're talking about, I think, the whole world of new skills that are acquired, uh, acquired, uh, the required, sorry, to deliver that because traditional marketers are not necessarily designed or trained to offer up content experiences in so many different ways mm. that, that, that can be done now through the rise of technology, through the rise of um, the more demanding consumers wanting things very much on their terms. Personalization is a big thing. So I think the companies that are really embracing that and are understanding that are doing very well. The companies that are a bit slower to the game that perhaps are being a little bit more traditional mm. are struggling. So we look at, the, I mean, the five losers, the five biggest losers um, on our list are Louis Vuitton, LVMH, owners of Louis Vuitton Motion. Right are the biggest fallers this year. I think they're over 50 places. That's a surprise. Well, in some ways, I feel terribly sorry for them because um, they're, they're the only genuine traditional luxury brand to make it onto the PwC yeah. Top 100 in the first place. And, and they've they, gone down. And they've gone <laughs> down. But they could easily argue that, well, at least we're on the list. Yeah. Um, so this undoubtedly a company with stature. Okay, yeah. Everyone on the list has stature. The ones that are struggling are losing momentum for a variety of reasons, but invariably linked to the experiences that they're, bring, that they're delivering into the world. Mm. Um, in the case of LVMH, I think the world has moved on in terms of what is now considered to be a luxury experience. Yeah. Um, we've moved on from the acquisition of, of stuff into wanting more independent, more tailored, more personal experiences. And I, I was reading an article the other day in, in the FT, which I thought was great. It summed it up as, as a real shift away from busing Chinese tourists straight to Bista. They're much <laughs> more likely to want to have a personalized experience with a Michelin-starred chef. Yeah. And that is the new luxury. And I think whilst... 
craft remains critical to true luxury experiences. The ability to have something personal, to have something shareable, to have something that is almost intangible mm. seems to have real social cachet these days. And it just seems to me that, like I said, some of these more traditional companies that have grown up very successfully doing things the old way, mm. should we say, are finding it a little bit more painful to make the leap into, this, into the new era. I no doubt they will. And, you know, companies like that never lie down and they fight back and they find new ways to do things. And, and it's the same with, 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 with the Unilevers of this world. The brands that are on there that I have slightly more concerns for are brands that are brands like, for example, Walmart. Right. Has, you know, a tradi- you know very t- quite traditional, quite big. I don't know how able to adapt they'll be. Uh, HSBC is, is quite a big struggler this year as well. You know, faced with big pressures, you know, quite seismic shifts in their, both mm. of those industries around the rise of data, personalization, um, and the way that, uh, you know, the whole of, um, of those categories is being s- somewhat disintermediated and disrupted by the likes of Amazon, Amazon yeah. Go, and and some of the discounters that are really disrupting. And a million challenger banks. Absolutely. Well. absolutely. And, and payment brands. Mm. I mean, payment brands... Um, I mean, we have Visa and MasterCard. It, really interestingly, extremely, you know, Visa, you know, the, 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 the benchmark, uh, you know, in terms of an institution, but positive on our, on mm. our survey. Again, they've embraced innovation hugely. Uh, MasterCard, similarly, has, has improved as well, um, ha, have grown. And when you look outside of the list, there is certainly an interest. I mean, I have daughters and they are excited as much by the likes of Monzo yeah. and Revolut and TransferWise than they are necessarily going mm. to the traditional banks for, for, for banking because they are moving around the world much more. We have you know, low-cost flights. Mm. The idea of wanting to move money and pay, mon- pay in different currencies is interesting. And I, one thing we, we have noticed in a separate study, which, which is due to come out in a few weeks' time, is when it comes to the ideal experience around payment, around spending money, amongst that sort of millennial Gen Z, sorry to use a buzzword of the year, <laughs> yeah, but hey, it's the right place to do it. Band, yeah, I think everyone's chamber. millennial these days, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a diehard Gen X, I'm absolutely fine about the millennials. Yeah, rubbish, dis- what a rubbish bunch. <laughs> and it, they've let us down in every way. Don't start me on the baby boomers. But, the, um, but it's interesting when you look at, you know, people, kids who are sort of in their you know, mid to late teens and their early 20s, there's something really interesting about them when it comes to the ideal payment experience. They want to know where their money is. They want to feel connected mm. to it. They don't want, they like, like this idea that my money is somehow vanished away and vanished into some fund and I don't know where it's going. And I think what some of these p- new payment brands are offering people is that sense of feeling connected to my money mm. or at least feeling in control of it. And I think if you've grown up with the uncertainty that they have, feeling connected tightly to something that is yours i think this is a quite a powerful emotion and i think the need to bring that if you're an hsbc to bring yeah. me back to my point about the fallers is 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 one of those interesting opportunities for companies like that and mastercard's interesting because they're you know they're an older brand but they nailed brand experience quite early absolutely. for the financial sector absolutely didn't they? absolutely i think mastercard has always had a sort of youthful edge to it yeah. They've always been strongly associated with uh, major sports and music events, festivals, festivals and stuff, yeah. yeah, and they've kept that going. They've also had, and it's a really key point here, that the, all the brands on our survey obviously have a degree of stature because they're the you know, top 100 global companies. Yeah. But having stature is only going to get you so far, and, and it's the need to create momentum through experiences. And MasterCard's a really great example of a company that's acquired the stature by, I think, through a close association with Visa, mm. And having, it has to some extent that, that stature, you know, what are the two leading payment brands in the world? It's those two. And then um, the ability to create momentum around the brand is something that MasterCard have continually done pretty well, I think. Um, and it's something that I think has in, sort of in a funny sort of way may have inspired Visa mm. to find its youthful side, to find an innovation side as well. So the two of those guys seem to be moving along with, the, with being chased down by these sort of ar- new arrivals in the payment space. Um, and tell me a bit about, let's go back to technology and healthcare. Sure. They seem to be two of the most interesting sectors this year. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, it was funny. I was, yesterday I was talking on CNN to the guys in the States. about. I mean, I think it was linked on the back of a Google story, mm. you know, and the, the way Google, uh, obviously Alphabet being the owner of them, and we, we track Alphabet. I mean, Google's had its challenges around Google+, and there is certainly a sense that, and across our survey, the drivers of technology, so things like um, having strong principles, bringing new ideas to the world, changing people's lives for the better, um, pleasure, has become sort of more sort of at least blurred in pe- in, in in the minds of, of of certainly of our global public. Mm. Um, now you can 
make any number of assumptions as to what's causing that at the very you know the, from a from a publicity point of view what's right up there in terms of the pr conversation is the privacy and data issues of course, yeah. but you know i think it's probably a little bit more nuanced than that and, and you probably see that if i have for example a and i'm not going to particularly name any one brand but if i have a home assistant that one it could be any <laughs> of them I've had two, then neither of them seem to know where I live, you know, and, I, and it's easier just to look out the window to know what the weather is. That's than quite ask. bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, it could just be a quirk of my house. It's like but, hashtag uh, fail. Exactly. I mean, I'm, okay, I'll look it up on the, you know, where's CFAX when you need it? But the, um, <laughs> but, uh, but the, you know, the, there is a degree of, in the end, these things could be amazing. In the end, having Alexa in everything connected is, you know, for how long have we heard about the uh, internet enabled fridge? Mm. But I think that's, just because you can doesn't mean to say it's always going to necessarily be a good thing, mm -hmm. certainly in the short term. And while technology is never set, one of the truisms, the timeless truths of technology is it's always changing. What's really happening in technology right now, it seems to be a slight confidence crisis in the minds of responders, our, our global public, around technology businesses. Mm. Um, on the one hand, people in, our, in, our, um, uh, in the Future Brand Index say, I do not doubt that the future will be shaped by companies like Alphabet, like Apple, like Tencent, um, no doubt. And NVIDIA and Adobe have also appeared in, in the list as well. Um, but at the same time, I'm not sure what the positive, of, the positive impact on my life of they are, those companies are right mm. now, which on the one hand is an is a uncertainty, but on the other hand does create possibility. I mean, in the States, Verizon is a, it's a really interesting example of a company that came from telco, traditional mm. telco, but is moving into to, to, to technology, a broader technology play, because there is the potential, I believe, because there is this uncertainty around the traditional tech brands. So it's creating people looking around a little bit for companies that can make my homework better or yeah. make my life easier or, or, or add value to my life in some way. Um, and companies like Verizon are doing quite a good job of transferring their credibility in one space into the, into the technology space. On the other hand, you get technology companies, uh, healthcare companies rather, and if I was running a tech company these days, I would definitely be wanting to look at help the way the healthcare brands are, you know, are in some ways nailing it mm. when it comes to what technology should be doing. There is no doubt that, um, I mean, pleasure for tech in, for healthcare companies is quite high, you yeah. know, which I don't, I mean, the idea of healthcare and pleasure for me are not necessarily two things that go together, no. but well-being, the general sense of well-being mm. is a, is a, obviously a major human driver these days. And it's not just living, it's living well and living long. And um, healthcare brands with a sort of, on the one hand, biopharma, but also, you know, technology and devices are creating tons of interesting life affirming and life improving um, uh, um, solutions that are making people's lives tangibly better every day, giving people confidence, allowing people to, as I say, live longer and better. Mm. And there's definitely a, something going on around the whole transhumanism trend, the idea of not just making people live longer but almost upgrading mm. upgrading humanity you know people having not just knee replacements but positive you know I mean, this is a bad example but you know semi-bionic bits being put into my body yeah all for that yeah me too yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, bring on the retinal implants. Yeah, I never saw the bionic so. man only had one <laughs> bionic leg. What? How did he ever not run around in circles? But anyway, <laughs> the um, but uh, yeah, I mean, but the idea of people actually wanting to upgrade themselves, not just in terms of linked to things like Fitbit and what have you, mm. but actually, you know, much more, much more advanced ways, is something that actually people are quite excited about. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And tell me, who's doing well in who's who's providing those kind of well-being brand experiences in the healthcare, in the healthcare space. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, as I said, the top of our list is, is brands like J&J, Gilead, AbbVie. Mm. So American predominantly right now. Uh, Med, Medtronic is another good example of that, uh, device, a devices company. So it's a combination of biopharma and mm. devices. GSK I mentioned as well. There's also Chinese brands. I mean, some of them aren't necessarily coming through right now, but there, there are a bunch of interesting Chinese pharma mm. brands. Who, and we do quite a lot. This is kind of outside of the survey perhaps, but... We do quite a lot of work in China now, and what we notice is that there's a lot of um, uh, Chinese brands run by pe uh, people who are naturally Chinese but have been educated around the world. Mm. They are very keen to comply with the uh, standards and regulatory standards that exist at, at an international level. Uh, for sure, they have, in some instances, some degree of you know party backing, mm. and they, but they have an incredibly large domestic market. Mm. Um, they have a aging population. They have some of the problems that China faces are the problems the world faces. So they're actually got a lot of credible experience. And also they are um, uh, finding uh, that um, 
the kind of the Chinese attitude to life, this slightly more, it's not spiritual, but some of the things that they highly value, mm. um, harmony, um, slow, steady evolution, um, is definitely something, something I heard Tim Sutton say actually on this, one of these podcasts, you know, his, and his experience in China's, you know, fantastic. Yeah. But there's definitely something about the values that exist within naturally Chinese or t- Chinese companies that I think are becoming increasingly globally mm. credible and interesting and relevant. So I think they're quite well positioned. And, and as you asked earlier, long, you know, three or four years down the track, the, 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 the public who we spoke to, when we asked them which brands are likely to be moving ahead in three years' time, not mm. just now, that typically is dominated by tech companies, by healthcare companies from, and, and financial mm. life insurance companies, actually, from China and America. And it's, it's interesting that you've got a uh, the Chinese liquor giant, Kui Chao Mutai. Is yeah. that how you pronounce it? It's yeah. gone straight into number two in yeah. the world out, yeah. of, out of nowhere. I mean, where, where have they come well, from? We say out of nowhere. It's, it's a 20 year old biggest spirits brand in the world. Um, so, uh, you know, if, you know, if, if it's interesting that um, if you spend a lot of time in China and, and in the Far East, it's not such a surprise. Mm. They slightly, um, uh, they grew and then slightly dipped back and now they're, they're growing again on the back of, uh, you know, the, the, corporate gifting um and this this is not a cheap product yeah. this is you know I, I, off the top of my head i think it's like 200 bucks a bottle um and what they've created though is they've created a whole it's not just a product there's a whole ritual and a whole ceremony around it and mm. there's a whole bunch of associations they're also looking to create experiences way beyond the product so it comes with its own world they've actually over i think they've overtaken diageo in oh. terms of the biggest spirits brand in the world of late the reason they're so high on our survey is because because we speak to an informed global public when they are really excited or have real intense mm. positivity around a brand, the methodology allows for those brands to rise very high. Because right, if okay. the, the logic goes, if these people who are somewhat influential are very passionate about a brand then you, and you're talking about the future, mm. the likelihood is that the rest of us We'll yeah. pick it up and, and we'll, it, we'll it'll trickle down. We'll come on eventually, exactly. Um, they've got a university hotel coming yeah. up. Yeah, exactly. This is my point. This is this is so. When I mentioned back on Nestle, it's, Nestle don't just think about we make products anymore. They yeah. create services and experiences. Yeah. That's exactly the same with with Maltai. They're looking to create not just a product but a bunch of uh, associated experience around it. Um, tell me a bit about some surprises this year. What surprised you? Um, well, Maltai was a really big mm. surprise for me. Um, if I'm being, you know, I think Amazon not being in the top 20 mm. was a surprise for me. And if you look at all the other, um, brands ranking brand, what top 100s, which I believe exist, I don't, can't think who they are, but I think those exist. And, and all of those, almost Amazon is in the top one, two or three. So why aren't they in the top of this one? Well, I think that, like I said, I mean, there's, there is, they partly suffer from the tech, the tech thing mm. where there's no doubt Amazon in my, Amazon is pervasive or all pervasive and dominant. And um, it is it, it is definitely changing my life, but is it changing my life for the better? Yeah. I need Amazon, but I don't know if I want it. Exactly. Mm. And it's so damn convenient. Mm. We yeah. all use it. But then we see these terrible stories about the way staff are treated. I can't be sure whether that's the driver of this, but you, mm. you see about, um, you know, the, the, the amount staff are paid. I don't know if that's true um, necessarily, but it's certainly in the, in the ether. Yeah. Um, you hear about their tax situation or mm-hmm. the rest of it. I also think that there's something quite interesting about Amazon Go, their new, um, which which is kind of a, on the, it's, it, for me, it's a really polarizing experience. Like Amazon Go is their new retail bricks and mortar experience. Oh, we can, yes, go and actually buy stuff from Amazon. Yeah, but in but, a shop. Yeah, but as, and as, as a non shopper, the idea of it sounds like a dream to me. You walk in, you pick up what you want, and you walk out again, and yeah. there's no queue. All the, all the, on the one hand, it, and this really is technology in a, in a, mm. in a nutshell in terms of the, the tensions around it. For a certain type of um, user, customer, Amazon Go is a dream. You walk in, you pick up what you want. You don't have to go to a till. You mm. don't have to talk to anyone and you walk straight out again. <laughs> that is That for me is paradise. shopping. Yeah, that <laughs> dream. But at the same time, in order for that to happen, you walk in, they know who you are. They, you, they, you're being filmed from every angle. They have da- they're picking up data on you all the time. Mm. Now, I'm sure they're going to be responsible with that data. But for another type of shopper, that's a terrifying prospect that not only am I being, I'm being 100% observed m- multiple, mm. count, multiple times. So in, in one specific example i think is um, is is a nutshell ish yeah. challenge about what what technology is all about for some people it's it's nirvana for other people mm. it's the worst worst idea in the yeah, world so it, that was a surprise to me on the it's survey. exciting and scary at the yeah, same time yeah, exactly. isn't it i mean text i think we're we're all like where's tech going and yeah is it really going to enhance our lives or is it just going to be weird yeah exactly and i and i think to some extent because technology is always pushing possibility um and because as as humans we are you know mm. uh, uh, 
in different types of adoption modes. Some people are very confident and comfortable with that, and other mm. people take more time. I think that um, I think that 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 will that's just something that's always going to happen. Mm. Um, and it's down to those companies to make sure that the experiences they deliver are tied to some sort of purpose that actually makes people feel good. Mm. Right now, I think people are a little bit uncertain about whether what they're doing is actually f- f- for the better. Yeah, you know? I totally agree with you. I mean, like being listened to the whole time is. You know, are we are we being micro targeted cleverly with smart data, or are we being stalked? And is that so, good or bad? Is and is it good, good or bad? bad? Yeah. Do, yeah. Do we care? How much yeah. do we care? I mean, I don't know if you've noticed all the people that now have spotted a bit of um, bit of a post it. They pop on their camera on top of the screen now because they. I, th- I don't know where it's coming from, but there's a general belief that this camera on the top of your screen is something that is being used to watch you. I don't know wow. if that's true or not. I wasn't feeling paranoid before. No, no. I am now. <laughs> yeah. um, so tell me about predictions for next year, brands that expect to do well and less well and why. Well, um, while I would obviously say we're not massively in the prediction business, um, uh, but... You do have the word future in your, future brand. literally in your job yeah, but <laughs> I do, but I'm, what we say is the future can be shaped. Yeah. We're not saying necessarily that, that, that things will happen, whether you, you, know, you can actually do something about it. And... When it comes to prediction, I think anything is possible for any of the companies on this, on on this, um, mm. on this, and indeed any any brand these days is in control of its own destiny. Okay, so that's the first thing. I would, I if it, if you want me to look at what is likely to happen in the future, I think that the brands that will keep bubbling up to the top will be the ones that not just have a differentiated purpose, and and to some extent, it doesn't really matter if your purpose is differentiated or not. Is is it meaningful to the people you're trying to engage? Um, be that you know the people who work for you or the people who you're trying to get to get to come and work for you or the people you're trying to sell to Mm. Um, so have you got a purpose that actually means something and are you delivering you know real life experiences stuff Mm. little things big things that make people really go do you know what I love you for that that's an amazing thing that you brought into my life you've made my life easier or happier or better or whatever it happens to be and I think the, the people who do that with the most degree of credibility will be the ones who who um who who go forward I also think that inevitably the US and China will become more dominant, mm. partly because of what we just talked about earlier. But also I think these, these companies, these, these companies based in those, um, those markets have such a strong domestic home market mm. that it gives them such an advantage. It gives them such a commercial and, and marketing clout. And I think if you're a brand that doesn't come from those countries, particularly mm. a British brand right now, right now, which has decided, mm. unfortunately in Britain, we seem to have decided to opt out of our own powerful home market yeah. by going it alone. I think that it's going to be more of a, more of a struggle, I think, or at least mm. we're going to have to find different ways for British brands to, um, to compete because we don't necessarily have that bench strength that, that naturally. But that's, that's not to say that there isn't an opportunity for individual brands from anywhere in the world mm. to genuinely compete but i do think that in the future um, life insurance financial healthcare, and technology will be very exciting spaces mm. um, and i think the chinese and, and american brands if they play their cards right will certainly be dominant and just to finish off what would be your so if i'm a brand guardian whether i'm an in-house marketing mm-hmm. or comms person or, or one of their agency what would be my key takeaways from the index this year in terms of what I can do to make sure that the brand I'm working for is one of those that is, is, is rising up? If, sure. you know, even if they don't make the top 100, there's, sure, there's sure. lessons for everyone sure. from the top 100. How can you, how can you make sure your sure. brand's going up rather than down? Yeah, so, so I mean, I, we've talked a lot about you know, making sure your, your experiences line up with your purpose. If you are trying to make that happen, you are going to need um, two things. You're going to need to make sure that you have a properly diverse um, a group of people working with you and around mm. you, either within your company or through your um, your partner network, yeah. your agency it's network. Huge topic at the moment. Yeah, and, and diversity, I think, has in some ways been reduced down to things like um, you know gender and race and all this sort of stuff. I think diversity is the key to creativity, mm. and having a diverse group of people from anywhere, from all walks of life, in and around your business is absolutely critical. Mm. Um, and I think, so that's the first thing. I think making sure you have genuine grown up approach to diversity in all its, in, in a really, you know, in a really um, meaningful way mm. in and around your business. The second thing is um, there's a holy trinity here around being good on data. I think that's really key. Your data and targeting. I mean, the data is, is obviously gone mad. I mean, the whole, the whole marketing it's, world has gone bonkers it's a for lot data. Of data now. But it's only one part of the puzzle. Mm. And I think, you know, having a good you know, data and targeting is key. What's also critical is your ability to really understand the psychology of your 
audiences, mm. you know, the, the deep down human psychology, not just consumer insight. Consumer insight is usually some charts that have been generated by the insight department of the big company. <laughs> and they're usually a bunch of data points. What they're not is really deep understanding of who you're trying to talk mm. to. I mean, we have a, a one of our one of our um, creative directors in Amsterdam lives and understands the lives of young shoppers like no one I've ever seen in the world. And, and when he can talk to you about the way that, that shoppers will look to what they're looking for when it comes to retail experiences is bar none in the world mm. because he really understands the psychology of the people he's talking to. And I think making sure you understand human psychology as well as data yeah. is key. And the third thing that is absolutely critical, and we heard you know John Hegarty talk, talking about it a lot right now, is creativity. You know? mm. And when I say creativity, it's creative execution and it's the ability to do things not just with an intelligence, but also with a beauty yeah. and making sure that whether it's the final execution through design or your advertising communications idea or your PR idea, or indeed your, your user experience that you're mm. creating on some sort of device, it has to be beautifully conceived mm. and beautifully delivered. So it's those three things together. So okay. data, humans, and creative delivery. Love it. I love that it all comes down to beauty and being human in the end, despite the end, all the data points. It, it, it still does. Um, yeah. There you have it, a formula for brand success in the index next year. We hope, John, it's been absolutely fascinating. Right, thank you for having thank, me. Thank you for joining me today. Cheers. You've been listening to The Echo Chamber. Brought to you by The Homes Report and produced by Marketeers. Sponsored by The Bullet Group, putting you in tomorrow's conversations today.